How do you measure that? It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, if anything, I think it's about create. A lot of this is long term. It's about creating an environment, you know, where people are less inclined to rely upon stereotypes mm -hmm. to react. Um, but you, you had mentioned. I was just writing this down as, as you were talking. Um, what's so good about Korean public schools? What's so special about it? I think that when countries. Uh, Countries think that the, a good public diplomacy is going to be sticking to one message, mm -hmm. but they tend to get it wrong, mm -hmm. right? So the Korean, the, tar the the people that Korea is talking to, want different things at different times. Mm -hmm. They don't always want, you know, go U.S. or go whatever country. They want something about sports, or they want something about Taekwondo or food or something, you know, and or education or science. Mm -hmm. So. I think the lack of coordination isn't necessarily such a bad thing. I'm not saying the coordination isn't necessary, but you know, that's what. Th so that's why I think it's interesting to think about the Korean public diplomacy. Right. You know, and it may not be as as disorganized as it looks um, from outside observers. Mm -hmm. Fragmentation is always a <laughs> problem in Korea. Also applies to the ODA yeah. development right. systems. Every depart department in government trying to do their own business, so it's not co coordinated. So yeah, reduces the efficiency of the system. So that's quite natural for Korean culture because mm. every department has own. Uh, has its own budget. Oh, right. And their own interests. So here, in public diplomacy, uh, it might be the same. It well, in part, and I think also, as I said earlier, people aren't asking the right questions. So there are some organizations that are really interested in, say, how many people on Twitter are using our hashtags, right? Where that becomes, from an organizational perspective, that is the goal in itself, not how does that, what does that mean for a broader strategy? So getting those different organizations to work together, you know, maybe, you know, I think it's not unique to Korea, that yeah. problem. So my research is mostly on the United States now. It's the use of digital technology. But here in the U.S., it's a very streamlined. You know, it's focused on the uh, State Department. Yes. It's not so spread out. Uh, Although almost every federal department has some kind of public diplomacy component to it. But it's, it's coordinated. In theory, <laughs> but not well. Uh, because, in part, because the USIA is gone. There's no there's no agent responsible the way they used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still there, but I think you raised another point, which I thought was really important about the, the CSIS. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that we can look to to, pr to demonstrate whether public diplomacy is working. Like if, building on what uh, my colleague here said, if we pay attention to how the media is framing the story and the controversy as opposed that's a public diplomacy act, right? Right, yeah, true. and not uh, you know that's something we can track. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to write that article, but uh -huh. it was a must do from from our desk. Yeah, it, it it pleases the the readers, uh, right? In, in Korea, so it, it's nationally. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, look at the, some of the things that Japan has done, which makes no sense, but because of a certain political constituency, you know, they do things that don't, mm -hmm. you know, that reflect a certain, yeah. you know, part of the population. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, 
understanding how language constrains how audiences understand international events is important for a public diplomacy for practitioners. Mm -hmm. And that could be the objective. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that uh, media is also a practitioner of public diplomacy? I think, well. Or oh, it is utilized? I think you oh. cannot. The media does not have to be on the government payroll to have a public diplomacy impact, mm -hmm. right? So, well, some media does uh, Arirang, right? Internet broadcasting. But that's a separate thing, and, and and they can help. You know, they can try to shape media frames, right? Media stories that circulate, but um, but I absolutely think uh, that if media is the way the in which yeah, yeah, I see that. Publics understand the world. You, you are you then cards? You have to pay attention to the yeah, stories they're telling. Right? That makes them very powerful. Whether or not they're on the government payroll. So, but again, you know, then the question is well, what media are important? So, this study, right, about the coverage of the U.S., that's just about the paper coverage. But my question would be, all right, what role do newspapers play in important publics in Korea, mm -hmm. right? Does, just historically, do newspapers shape foreign policy, mm -hmm. or is it the other way around? Mm -hmm. Because if it's, if it's negative coverage of the US, that may not matter. Yeah, right? it only affects the, the opinion, re opinion readers, uh, readership of the newspaper, quite diminished. Right. Okay. A small portion of people. I mean, that's that's true here too. <laughs> but I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that it's that's an important question. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough just to see how many people are tuning in or reading your paper. It's who's doing it. What are they doing with that information? And I know my last question was a bit naive because oh, no, no. I was not so familiar with. The Academic firm. You know, there's there are very few good case studies that show how this can make a difference. We know intuitively that it does, but it's hard to prove in specific cases. But for example, military exchanges, studies have shown that they when different groups work together collaboratively that has outcomes that last. Mm -hmm. You know, that inc encourage trust, that you can instill values and cultural ideas. Um, you know, the soft power that people keep talking about. Mm -hmm. So there are examples. Um, but as you said, in terms of reconciliation, the people who know about this aren't the public diplomacy scholars. They're the people that are interested, you know, like in the Israel-Palestine situation, mm -hmm. or South Africa, you know, those kinds of programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a good question, and it's a question that needs to be asked. So it's not naive at all. Anyway, I'm sorry. Thank, I'm thank you sorry for to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was a pleasure to meet you, and nice thanks for you. asking me to clarify what I was talking about. <laughs> thank anyway. you. Uh, are you going tonight, or are you? Tonight, are you going to be around tonight? Or are you no, I, I'm going to the Brookings uh, cover another conference. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a journalist. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's to work now. <laughs> great to get on your schedule. Okay. See, maybe tomorrow night. Tomorrow dinner is uh, hosted by Korean ambassador. Oh, you really? Are, you are not invited? Well, I am unfortunately teaching tomorrow night. Oh, okay. So I can't. I got to teach the people that want to be public diplomacy officers. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the invitation. Or the Maybe uh, some other time uh, I can interview you uh, for about the sure. public diplomacy. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have my email. So yeah, yeah. anyway, okay. thank, see you. You. See you. thank you. Good to meet you.
Sir Heppenstall, good to, see you. good to see you as well. How How's everything? Good. How are the grandkids? Good. They're big now, aren't they? One just you heard Barnard. Oh my God. Oh my God. That yeah, that ages that, everybody. That ages everybody. But my, my one and only is a year old, so I, I, yeah, I may or may not live long enough to see that one. Wow. In, uh, so how are you doing? Good. Good. How's it's, well, I, yeah, I've been idle for a little while on the journalism front. I took a buyout from Reuters uh, last year, so I've communicated a few times with Sonia. Yeah, um, she, I, I think the mic is on, unfortunately. So, um. <laughs> so you took a buyout? Yeah, yeah. So I've got something new in the pipeline, which I can't talk about definitively, but in 2015, I enjoyed my retirement. I did a lot of bass fishing with my father. He had, he had a triple bypass in May, so he needed slow, leisurely time. Plus, he, they still live in the farmhouse I grew up in, so you know how rural homes have a lot of work to do. So I was a, a bit of a farmhand or homestead hand. So are you still living in DC? I'm still living in DC, but I, I took advantage of not having to do anything but um, to, to go up to Pennsylvania for a while. There's another lawyer's colleague just living down from me about it. Right on 522. Oh, is that Deborah, Deborah Charles who bought the farm? Yeah. And she's also uh, taken a buyout, but she's an old friend of Sonia's. Yeah, they—they, they, I, I imagine she would go back to with Sonia to the to the late '80s uh, because she was in Bangkok and yeah, yeah. Oh, Deborah's great. Her husband's a pilot, and she's a very active um, 
sportswoman, rower, runner, cyclist, all of that. Well, she does say she, that's right, she was running past our place. Oh, yeah. Well, she's a, she's a very active and dedicated cancer survivor. So she does all of the charity work, all of the, you know, the athletic events, the Susan Komen walks, her own sort of uh, program. Uh, even, and she also took a buyout from Reuters, too, so she's probably doing more of that stuff now, but she was always very active on that. Well, I mean, Sonia just decided to stick it out there. Sure. She'd like to have her, you know, oh, 30 years, 25 years? Boy, he's a junior in high school. Okay. They, they're, are they going to stay in London? Well, yeah, well, that'd be good. They're happy there. I, I last spoke to Sonia, and it, it yeah. ended up being an abortive attempt. But, but, but your grandson is a big soccer fan. He was following Manchester United all over. And they were going to be talking Manchester. So make sure, so make sure what you pronounce. I was just going to be in Northern England for another reason. But then, at the last minute, something broke through, and they didn't go. Yeah. So, so B-A-K? Yeah. It's impressive. Oh, no, no, it's B-O-K, but somewhere well, for exciting. your talking it's points, it's like Myung Bok. So what should I say? It's Myung Bok. 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 B-O, yeah. Bok. Oh, Bok. Oh, oh, we give it a whole lot. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be great mm -hmm. I'd be happy. Yeah. Thanks. No, no. And I love that <laughs> oh, part of the country, too. Completely different connotation. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's going to look around. Really easy. Yeah. <laughs> Joseph Hilbo is here. I'm going to insult them. Oh, their sorry. Coverage, their coverage of Japan is just outrageous. Sorry, not here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's one of my one of my cautions is to stay out here. Is that journalists of all stripes, uh, yeah. importantly in Northeast Asia, need to stay out of the national news, stay on the sidelines. I try, but they but they don't. Oh no, that's the, well, that's this, part um, of it. I, you 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 will not have seen this, but Aki Nakashima, who ought to know better. Proudly sent out some this from the Yomiuri. It oh. is trash. Oh, it's it the truth. Fucking believable. <laughs> and then, excuse me. I, I think the microphone oh, is on. Beyond, okay. The microphone is on. And in the, back, in the back here, <laughs> they but uh, in the back here they've got the truth on comfort women, and it's heck? it is pure propaganda. There's no journalism in here. I mean, they should be. They're proud of it. That's harsh, yeah. It's awful. Anyway, so I'm gonna lose well, I don't want to get you know. excitement or get Well, this is Japan, but, yeah. but it's, you know, yeah. I would say the nationalism of the mm -hmm. press is, uh, you know, once you get past Fox News, we're, we're pretty good about it, I think. Mm -hmm. But Fox is great. You know, whenever I'm overseas, if I watch Fox, I, fi I just find it... Cringing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's gotten worse. It's gotten As it worse. Is, I think, I, you know. yeah. The only thing I watch Fox for is sports, which is perfectly good. And, and my my father's not that imbued, but my mother's a hardcore Fox watcher, and it's not like she. Yeah, so she you gotta watch what you say. <laughs> no, she was, no, but she. Yeah. I do, uh, because I. You know. There, are, Fox has people that I refer to. Yeah. Hello, professor. Okay. I can recall interviewing you at your office at Yihuang oh, ten years ago on at the time when Hun was president. I, it was probably about yeah, China-U.S. Yeah, relations. Yeah, good to see you again. You said as well. <laughs> How's everything? You look the same. Yeah, thanks. Doing good at Yihuang? Yeah, I'll tell you. Because, I mean, scrutiny, there is, there are areas where... Uh, As my first editor at UPI said, Chris, it ain't news when the plane lands. 
Yeah. Well, it, 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 <laughs> you know, why not? I'm okay, boss. And there's, if, if you just, I just, I, I, read, I read in on Mark Mannion's latest opus, which dropped this mm -hmm. summer, you know, his CRS stuff. Right, right. Yeah, it was and, great. And, and yeah. they, you know, it's a good survey of the horizon with some, some mm -hmm. deep footnotes. But essentially, you know, the relations are pretty placid right now. Yeah. And, so, some kicking of the can down the road with one, two, three. Yeah, but yeah. Still I mean, I mean, the, you know, the episode over Gasomia has sort of receded as we're all worried about Abi and Yasukuni, and now he's messing up with the Chinese and all that. But yeah. And but you know, I guess we're getting the one, two, three agreement done, and mm -hmm. you know, we've got I, the yeah. first done. And Lord Wallach doesn't like it, but you know. <laughs> One more hour and we can serve beer. Happy hour? <laughs> yeah. oh, actually, what is this going to be? Public diplomacy in the U.S. So the, 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 that's, that's what the whole thing is about. Yeah, the theme and then within that. Uh, yeah, I think grab it. Again, a bit of policy. Public diplomacy forum. Oh. Um, Bay, very nice to meet you. Paul Eckert, enjoyed your papers. I, I bought something for you for your files. Um, this is something I did back in 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can send you an email version, but it's one of those things you can't cut and paste. Okay. Uh, but that's, that's kind of fun because I did it for uh, a conference in Seoul. <laughs> and some of the questions I look at are still valid. Oh. Nice to meet you. Thanks the paper. Mr. Bay, I'm afraid I'm without cards today, so I'll keep take note of your contacts and send you a note. So do we call you Professor? Uh, professor, no, I, I don't know. We can promote you to doctor, have that. <laughs> <laughs> put it in my report tonight, so let's see if there was something new. Mindy had a terrific, Mindy Cotler had a terrific op-ed at the Times yesterday, which, I'm, which I do have in my report. Oh, my friend's linked to that. I didn't realize I that. Yeah. It's fabulous. No, it's, it, 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 you, if you get my report still, you, uh, you'll get it. It's, it's no. sort of menacing because they they push towards the brink of kind of revising Kono and then they step back and say, oh, and then they throw that red meat to the me. The fussing is so, it's so dishonest. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, we support Kono. We just under, undercut everything in it. But we support it. Yeah. Don't, you know. And that Asahi problem snafu is so, so Asahi really screwed not. up. But on the other hand, what's being done to Asahi is outrageous. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, threats, yeah. The way the other pap paper papers have bandwagged, certain conservative papers have bandwagged too. Well, the, the Omiuri has, has been very ganged up on them. I think in yeah. the most you know it's most are exactly, and it's not merely commercial. It's a lot. It's, it's, it's I really serious. Thought, I thought it's better if the Omiuri really did, and obviously I was wrong, and it's very disappointing. Yeah. I mean, journalism is hard enough if you're not going to play perfectly. Yeah. Where's the Where's the Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very nice, yeah. <coughs> Yesterday, I didn't like give my business. Oh, thank you. Doesn't look like a particularly harsh crime. Um, uh, that time 
the day, the time of year, and all that. Yeah, this hour of the day. Is, uh, I found that you can understand common words. My understanding is a heck of a lot better than my speaking. Yes. <laughs> Didn't you, how did you find, find your back to Korea on a visa? Well, I, um, the Asan people have been bringing me over for the plan in, in May and June, or whatever that is. So, yeah, so that's been an annual for the last yeah, that year. So that's right. I'm hoping they'll do it again next year. I'm assuming that's So you can understand the Korean language in paper? Well, we actually, but the documents that we're getting uh, the come awesome discussions are, are, are really interesting. Yeah, they, do. Um, they do a lot of good research. They do. Um, primarily from yeah, they back uh, it up with actual real, uh, real research. Eastern European, mm. Chinese. And <laughs> Prince on being introduced first, or? versus as we go along? However, whatever works for you. <laughs> it's up to you. I guess I'll introduce you as, as we go along. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hope everyone is, is uh, thoroughly caffeinated. Um, I'm James Person, uh, Deputy Director of the History and Public Policy Program here at the Wilson Center. The History and Public Policy Program does a lot of work on Korea, uh, primarily um, in, in uh, gathering, uh, translating, and disseminating international archival documents on modern Korean history. Uh, we um, run the Modern Korean History Portal that was mentioned by uh, Vice President Blair Rubel this morning. I, I also encourage you all to visit. Uh, it really is uh, something that we're very proud of. It's a great resource for learning a lot about um, uh, the history of, of um, uh, Korea uh, over the past, um, or uh, over the, the throughout the 20th century. Korea's 20th century odyssey, I suppose we can say. Um, uh, great resources, including timelines, archival documents, profiles of historical figures, uh, and uh, essays. So. Um, Something we're very proud of. Um, so it's my pleasure to to um, uh, chair this panel on uh, the media and um, public relations, the role of the media in in uh, the U.S. ROK alliance. Um, public diplomacy has always been an important tool uh, in communicating a country's uh, policies, its values, and and its culture. However, the means uh, through which these these goals can be achieved considerably changed in the last hundred or so years. Um, uh, and, and politicians and, and scholars have had to, to face new challenges uh, uh, and to adapt to the new media era. Um, now, it's only fitting that we're holding this discussion here at the Wilson Center, uh, since one could argue that public diplomacy, as, as we interpret it today, was born with a certain speech uh, delivered by a man called Woodrow Wilson uh, in January 1918, the 14-point uh, speech, where diplomacy um, uh, became exposed to the media and, uh, uh, and through the media um, to the wider public, uh, which became uh, an attentive and very interested audience. This speech, the 14-point speech, as we know, sparked tremendous interest in Korea, inspiring the 1919 March 1st movement or the Samar Undong, uh, one of the earliest public displays of, of Korean resistance to Japanese colonial rule. Um, now, with the wide diffusion of television, bro television broadcasts and the internet, uh, media now assumes a, a more direct uh, and active role in diplomatic relations. And discussing the role of the media today in the US ROK Alliance, we have uh, two presenters and two discussants. Um, I am going to introduce them as we go along. Um, so our first uh, speaker um, uh, is um, from the Jungang Ilbo, um, uh, Mr. Myungbok Bae. Um, sorry, give me one second. There we are. 
He is uh, the editorial writer and, and diplomatic correspondent for the Jungang Ilbo, uh, which he joined in 1984. Um, he has his, his career as a reporter with, with the uh, Jungang Ilbo has taken him around the world, uh, spent time in Paris. Um, uh, since returning to, to Seoul, he, he has covered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, in 1997, he was reposted as a correspondent to Paris. Um, uh, uh, so where, and then he spent another three years in Europe. Um, uh, during his second uh, mission in Paris, he became the chief of the foreign news desk and foreign news editor, as well as traveling correspondent um, uh, in the U.S. Um, since 2006, he's been writing columns for the Jungang, Ilbo, or Jungang Daily. Um, in, uh, he has a, a bachelor's degree in, in French language and literature from Seoul National University. He also studied at SICE, Johns Hopkins SICE, uh, in D.C. Um, so uh, with that, I turn the floor to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> uh, as you introduced, my name is Pei myung uh, uh, I'm working as an editorial writer and a correspondent. In 2004, I spent a year in Washington, D.C., uh, attending a size and uh, traveling around in the United States. I found uh, it's always the same in Washington, D.C., uh, so what does it mean? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the topic uh, I am going to uh, dealing with is uh, the U.S.-Korea alliance and uh, the role of media. Uh, at the last session, uh, Professor Shin uh, explained uh, something about his perception on the Korean media's uh, treatment of uh, U.S.-ROK alliance and uh, our uh, reporting on U.S. Uh, but I think it was the from outsider's view. I'm going to uh, uh, deal with the insider's view. I'm insider of Korean media. Uh, from now on, allow me to speak in Korean, which is a much easier to, to commend. <coughs> uh, only uh, 2004, 2014, uh, 11월, uh, 17일, Washington, 시간으로 17일이고, 서울 시간으로는 11월 18일입니다. Uh, 정확하게 한미 동맹이 uh, 발효된 지꼭 오늘로 60년이 되는 날입니다. Uh, 나름대로 상당히 의미 있는 날 uh, 이런 uh, 포럼을 uh, 갖게 된것 같습니다. Uh, 한미 동맹의 성격과 그 역할에 대한 uh, 사람들의 생각은 뭐 사람마다 다를 수 있을 거라고 있을 거라고 봅니다. 그러나 어쨌든 2차 대전 이후에 미국이 체결한 그 양자 동맹 가운데 가장 성공한 동맹 중에 하나다라고 하는 평가에는 큰 이견이 없을 것으로 생각합니다. 과거 60년을 돌이켜보면 한미동맹 관계는 여러 가지 업앤다운이 있었습니다. 국제질서와 안보 환경 또는 그 국가 간의 상대적 역학관계 변화 등에 따라 여러 가지 도전과 위험에 직면하기도 했었습니다. 그때마다 양국 언론은 여론과의 상호작용을 통해 서울과 워싱턴의 정책 결정에 영향을 미치면서 한미동맹의 진화 과정에 기여해 왔다고 생각합니다. 오늘날 한미 양국이 추구하고 있는 21세기 포괄적 글로벌 동맹은 정책과 여론 사이에서 언론이 담당한 보이지 않는 역할이 긍정적으로든 부정적으로든 알게 모르게 반영된 결과가 아닐까 이렇게 생각합니다. 에, 국가 간 관계에서 여론의 중요성은 갈수록 커지고 있습니다. 소셜미디어의 발달로 에, 글로벌 이 리얼타임 커뮤니케이션이 가능해지면서 여론은 국가 간 상호 인식에 즉각적이고 광범위한 영향을 미치고 있습니다. 에, 상대국의 그 여론, 즉 상대국 국민의 heart and minds를 잡는 공공 외교의 중요성은 갈수록 어, 중요해지고 있는 것도 이 때문일 것입니다. 이런 점에서 여론을 반영하고 또 여론 형성에 영향을 미치는 미디어가 공공 외교의 중요 대상이 되는 것은 당연하다 할 것입니다. 한미 동맹의 현재와 미래에 있어서 미디어의 역할은 그 미디어 역할의 중요성은 아무리 강조해도 지나치지 않을 것입니다. 어, 어, 지난 10월 31일 서울의 그 마크 리포트 
신임 주한 미대사가 부임을 했습니다. 어, 그가 서울에 도착하는 날 어, 대부분의 한국 언론 매체가 어, 그의 도착 사실을 매우 크게 보도를 했습니다. 어, 그가 부인과 함께 인천공항에 내리는 장면을 담은 사진이 에, 사진을 아주 크게 일면에 에, 실은 신문도 있었는데 에, 제가 몸담고 있는 중앙일보도 그중 하나였습니다. 에, 그가 서울에 도착한 게 사실은 당초 예정보다 하루 늦어졌습니다. 그 이유가 어, 리퍼트 대사 부부가 키우는 그 애완견 때문이다 라는 뒷얘기까지 별도 기사로 친절하게 보도한 신문도 있었습니다. 한국에서 부수가 제일 많은 조선일보였습니다. 이 41살인 리퍼트 대사는 역대 주한 미 대사 가운데 가장 나이가 어립니다. 또 버락 오바마 대통령의 최측근 인사로 알려져 있습니다. 이런 점이 한국 언론의 뉴스같이 판단에 영향을 미쳤다 이렇게 생각할 수도 있지만 그보다는 한미동맹의 비대칭성이 언론에도 그대로 반영된 결과라고 보는 것이 더 맞지 않을까 생각합니다. 주한 미국 대사의 서울 부임 소식은 한국 언론의 관점에서는 늘 보도할 가치가 있는 뉴스입니다. 어, 과거 어, 30여 개에 달한 로마 제국의 그 속주 프라빈키아 주민의 입장에서 로마에서 파견된 총독의 일거수 일투족은 관심의 대상일 수밖에 없습니다. 어, 주한 미국 대사는 로마 제국이 누미디아나 트라키아 또는 뭐 코르시카에 보낸 총독 같은 자리다라는 비유적 인식이 알게 모르게 한국인들이 뇌리에 자, 자리 잡고 있을 수도 있다고 봅니다. 사실은 아니겠지만요. 에, 반면 주미 한국대사의 워싱턴 부임 사실이 미국 언론에서 뉴스가 된 적은 제가 기억하는 한 없습니다. 에, 한국 대통령의 그 방미 사실도 아주 특별한 경우가 아니고는 에, 미국 언론에서 거의 취급되지 않습니다. 로마의 시각에서 보자면 한국은 크고 작은 여러 속주 가운데 하나일 뿐이고 따라서 미국 언론의 관점에서는 뉴스 가치가 상대적으로 떨어질 수밖에 없습니다. 최근 1년을 검색기간으로 설정하고 중앙일보 인터넷 홈페이지에 미국이란 단어를 치면 19만 7,400건의 기사가 검색이 됩니다. 반면 뉴욕타임즈에 코리아란 키워드를 치고 어, 같은 기간 중 검색된 기사를 보면 1만 1,700건에 불과합니다. 이건 제가 직접 해봤습니다. 에, 그것도 남한 관련 기사보다는 북한 관련 기사가 훨씬 많습니다. 두 개의 코리아를 다 합해도 어, 뉴욕타임스에 실린 코리아 관련 기사는 중앙일보가 보도한 미국 관련 기사의 20분의 1에 불과하다는 계산이 나옵니다. 에, 한국이 미국에 일방적으로 의존하는 후견인, 피후견인 관계에서 지금은 대등한 입장에서 서로 도움을 주고받는 호혜적 동반자 관계로 한미동맹이 격상됐다 이렇게 말은 하지만 아직은 정치적 레토릭에 가깝다고 보는 것이 한국 언론인들의 지배적 인식입니다. 이런 인식이 알게 모르게 한미동맹과 관련한 뉴스같이 판단은 물론이고 나아가 사설이나 논평을 통해 여론 형성에도 영향을 미치고 있습니다. 어, 그 여론에 민감할 수밖에 없는 민주국가의 정부의 정책 결정 과정에도 당연히 영향을 미치게 되는 것입니다. 에, 다음에는 한국 언론의 내부적인 메커니즘을 좀 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 그 한미 언론 보도의 비대칭성은 한미동맹의 본질적인 비대칭성에 기인하지만 어, 한국 언론의 구조화된 미국 편향 아, 탓도 무시할 수 없다고 생각합니다. 예, 한국 그 주류 언론에는 일종의 그 정형화된 출세 코스가 있습니다. 음, 대개 정치부 어, 기자, 어, 그 다음에 청와대 출입 기자, 그 다음에 워싱턴 특파원, 정치부장, 에, 보도국장 또는 편집국장 에, 또는 편집인 주필 이렇게 이어지는 일종의 엘리트 코스입니다. 에, 물론 다 그런 건 아닙니다. 반드시 그런 건 아니지만 청와대나 아니면 집권 여당을 출입하면서 권력의 핵심을 취재했던 유능한 기자 사실상 진짜로 유능한 기자들입니다. 유능한 기자를 선발해서 워싱턴 특파원으로 보내는 게 신문과 방송을 막론하고 한국 메이저 언론의 일반적 관행입니다. 여기에 이제 워싱턴 특파원 분들도 와 계시는데 그 유능함은 이미 여기에 온 것으로 입증이 됐다고 봐도 됩니다. 한미동맹 체제의 출범과 함께 미국이 한국의 가장 중요한 나라가 된 이후에 굳어진 한국 언론계 오랜 관행 중에 하나입니다. 워싱턴 특파원은 최소한 3년 이상 워싱턴 미국에서 보내면서 
이 초강대국 미국의 파워 또 한미 관계의 비대칭적 실상을 현장에서 직접 보고 들으면서 몸으로 어, 느끼게 됩니다. 어, 이와 동시에 한국에서 파견된 엘리트 외교관 및 관료들은 물론이고 미국 내 정계, 관계, 재계, 언론계, 학계에 다양한 한국 관련 인사들과 네트워크를 형성하게 됩니다. 워싱턴 특파원 재임 기간 중 이렇게 형성된 미국에 대한 인식과 인맥은 귀임한 후에도 어, 한국 내에서의 언론 활동에 긍정적으로든 부정적으로든 일정한 영향을 미칠 수밖에 어, 없을 것입니다. 에, 특히 워싱턴 출신, 워싱턴 특파원 출신이 에, 대개 에, 많은 경우 정치부장을 맡는다는 사실은 한미 동맹과 관련한 보도에서 매우 중요한 에, 함의를 갖습니다. 에, 언론사마다 물론 또 차이는 있지만 일반적으로 정치부장은 국내 정치뿐만 아니라 외교 안보 분야에서도 외교 안보 분야까지도 같이 담당하게 됩니다. 한미 동맹과 관련한 중요한 이슈가 터졌을 때그 뉴스 가치를 판단하는 판단하고 보도 방향을 결정하는 일차적 책임을 정치 부장이 맡게 됩니다. 취재 지시를 함으로써 특정 사안을 이슈화하는 어젠다 세팅 권한도 갖고 있습니다. 지난 10년을 돌이켜 볼때 한미 간 첨예한 이슈가 됐던 효순 미선양 사망 사건, 광우병 파동, 주한 미군 재배치, 이라크 파병 주한미군의 전략적 유연성, 방위비 분담, 한미 원자력 협정, 전시작전통제권 전원 같은 문제에서 각 언론사가 취할 스탠스의 일차적 결정권을 정치부장이 갖고 있다고 볼수 있습니다. 가졌다고 볼수 있습니다. 최종적인 책임은 편집국장이나 방송용의 보도국장이 있지만 이들 또한 대부분 워싱턴 특파원과 정치부장을 거친 사람들인 경우가 많습니다. 사설과 칼럼, 논평을 통해 오피니언 형성에 큰 영향을 미치는 논설실장이나 논설주관도 워싱턴 특파원 출신인 경우가 많습니다. 특히 신문의 경우에는 보도와 논평 양쪽에 걸쳐서 그 절대적인 권한을 행사하는 편집인이나 주필도 이 점에서는 예외가 아닙니다. 워싱턴 특파원 출신이라고 해서 다 똑같은 건 물론 아닙니다만 하나의 그 가능성, 개연성을 놓고 볼때 미국과의 관계 설정에서 자주보다는 동맹을 중시하는 안보와 자주 그 트레이드 오프 그 교환론의 입장에 설 가능성이 큽니다. 또 미국에 대해서 저항적이기보다는 수능형 마인드셋을 자연스럽게 갖게 될 가능성도 큽니다. 그러니까 워싱턴의 경험에서 비롯된 그러한 그 자기 스스로의 자각 못지않게 워싱턴 생활을 통해 형성된, 형성된 네트워크의 영향도 클 것입니다. 워싱턴 경험을 공유한 한국의 정계, 관계, 군, 재계, 학계의 엘리트들과 자연스럽게 일종의 그 끼리끼리 문화, 피어 컬처를 형성하면서 어, 알게 모르게 미국에 대한 한국 내 여론의 흐름과 대미 정책 결정에 영향을 미치게 되는 것입니다. 한국 언론계에서 이른바 이런 지미파 또는 친미파로 분류되는 사람들 가운데는 어, 옳고 그름을 따지는 기준을 미국으로 삼는 경우가 적지 않습니다. 미국이라는 보편적 기준과 일치하면 할수록 올, 옳다 이렇게 생각하는 겁니다. 또 미국과 잘 지내는 것은 좋은 거고 미국과 마찰을 빚는 것은 나쁜 것이다 라는 이분법적 사고에 빠지기도 합니다. 그 노무현 정부 시절에 한국의 주류 언론들이 이 한미 관계를 이혼 직전의 파탄 상태로 과장되게 묘사하면서 여론 몰이를 한 데에는 한국 언론계를 지배하는 워싱턴 출신 엘리트 언론인들의 노무현 정부 대미 정책에 대한 우려와 불만 이 작용한 측면이 적지 않다고 생각합니다. 이명박 정부가 미국 일변도의 극단적 친미 성향으로 돌아선 것은 한국 주류 언론의 그 엔티 노무현 캠페인 이 일정 부분 성과를 거둔 결과라고 생각이 됩니다. 그 부작용을 박근혜 정부가 알고 있기 때문에 미국과 중국 사이에서 지금 스탠스를 조정하려는 모습을 보이고 있지만 큰 틀에서 보자면 여전히 미국 지향적인 구도에서 벗어나지 못하고 있다고 생각합니다. 아까 그전 세션에서 신호창 교수님께서 그 미국의 공공 외교가 과연 이게 성공을 했느냐 이걸 말씀을 하셨는데 저는 신 교수님 생각과는 많이 다릅니다. 미국은 한국 언론인을 상대로 매우 성공적인 공공외교를 펼쳐왔다고 생각합니다. 각종 연수나 견학 프로그램을 통해서 미국의 우호적인 언론인을 양성하는 데 상당한 노력을 기울여왔고 실질적으로 성과도 많이 거뒀다고 생각됩니다. 
이 한미동맹 초창기부터 어, 실시해온 한 달짜리 에, 미 국무부 연수는 미국에 의해 선택된 언론인들이 누리는 하나의 특권처럼 여겨져 왔습니다. 또 미국 정부는 기회가 있을 때마다 한국 언론인들을 초청해 미국의 다양한 측면을 보여주고 많은 미국인들과 네트워킹을 할수 있도록 지원을 아끼지 않아 왔습니다. 특히 한국 언론인들이 1년짜리 해외 연수는 미국의 우호적인 언론인을 양성하는 좋은 기회로 활용되어 왔습니다. 아, 한국 언론인들에게 1년의 해외 연수는 일종의 안식년 휴가로 인식되고 있습니다. 한국 언론인들은 압도적으로 미국을 연수지로 택하고 미국 대학에서 적을 두고 1년을 보내게 되는데 이 과정에서 주한미대사관은 비자 발급부터 대학 알선까지 여러모로 한국 언론인들을 돕고 있습니다. 한국 언론인들이 미국을 연수지로 택하는 것은 1년의 미국 경험이 자신의 경력 관리에 도움이 된다고 보기 때문입니다. 한국 언론에서 엘리트 코스로 통하는 워싱턴이나 뉴욕 특판을 노리는 데도 유리합니다. 미국 연수 기회를 활용해서 자신은 물론이고 자녀들의 영어 능력을 향상시키겠다는 현실적 계산도 아마 있을 것입니다. 에, 주한미국 대사관은 기회 있을 때마다 한국을 찾은 미국 인사와 한국 언론인들의 미팅을 주선하고 또 이런저런 모임을 통해 한국 언론인과의 네트워킹을 강화하는 노력을 게을리지 하지 않고 있습니다. 이, 이 점은 지난 어, 성김대사나 그 전에 스트링 어, 어, 캐드린 스티븐스 대사나 다 모두 마찬가지였다고 생각합니다. 어, 아마 마크 리포트 대사도 그럴 것입니다. 한국 주류 언론의 미국 편향적인 보도는 어, 미국 정부의 적극적이고 공세적인 어, 공공외교 노력이 주요한 측면도 무시할 수 없습니다. 한국 언론은 미국 공공외교의 대표적 성공 사례 중 하나다라고 저는 생각합니다. 에, 반면에 <웃음> 미국 주류 언론, 언론 가운데 한국의 상주 특파원을 두고 있는 언론사는 극소수에 지나지 않습니다. 에, 도쿄에서 같이 카바를 하거나 서울의 계약직 통신원을 두고 필요에 따라 활용하고 있는 경우가 대부분입니다. 에, 한국에 대한 어, 경험이나 지식, 에, 전문 지식을 겸비한 언론인은 많지 않습니다. 에, 논 오버더포처럼 걸출한 언론인도 어, 없지 않았지만 에, 그 역시 한국의 상주한 특파원은 아니었습니다. 에, 개인적 관심에서 한국에 에, 에, 천착한 에, 예외적인 사례였습니다. 미국 언론이 한국에 투여하는 인적, 물적 자원은 대단히 제한적입니다. 그럼에도 미국 언론은 한국에서 특권적 지위를 누리고 있습니다. 이따금 한국을 찾는 미국 기자는 청와대에서 정치권, 행정부, 기업에 이르기까지 폭넓은 억세스가 가능합니다. 역대 한국 대통령들은 미국 언론에 대해서는 대부분 개방적인 태도를 유지해 왔습니다. 국내 언론과의 인터뷰에는 인색한 대통령들도 미국 언론과의 인터뷰에는 매우 관대했습니다. 미국 언론이 누리는 이런 특권적 지위는 한국에 대한 근거 없는 오만이나 편견을 낳으면서 한미동맹에 부정적 역할을 미치는 왜곡된 보도의 원인이 되기도 했다고 생각합니다. 한국에 대한 종합적이고 체계적인 지식과 경험 없이 단편적이고 즉흥적으로 작성한 기사가 여론을 왜곡하고 그것이 정책에도 영향을 미치는 경우가 종종 발생하는 것입니다. 미국 언론을 상대로 한국의 적극적이고 공세적인 공공외교가 필요한 까닭입니다. 그러나 그동안 한국의 대미 언론 공공외교는 한국을 찾는 미국 언론인의 가이드 역할을 하는 그런 정도에 지나지, 지나지 않았다고 말해도 과언은 아닙니다. 미국 언론을 상대로 체계적이고 조직적인 공공외교를 펼칠 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. 이 점에서 한국 언론을 상대로 한 미국 공공외교의 성공 사례를 잘 연구할 필요가 있습니다. 한국에 대한 미국 언론의 인식도 바뀔 필요가 있다고 봅니다. 한국은 더 이상 한미동맹 초기의 낡은 프리즘으로 바라볼 그럴 나라가 아닙니다. 지금 이제 이 피바토 에이시아 시대를 맞아 한국의 전략적 중요성을 제대로 인식하고 한국의 역사와 문화, 언어를 제대로 구사할 줄 아는 한국 전문 기자들을 양성하는 게 미국 언론의 이익은 물론이고 한미동맹의 건강한 발전에도 도움이 될 거라고 믿습니다. 에, 마지막으로 어, 노무현 전 대통령은 어, 이런 말을 한 적이 있습니다. 미국인보다 더 친미적인 한국 사람들 때문에 골치가 아프다 어, 라면서 한국 파워 엘리트들의 미국 편향성에 에 대한 불만을 토로한 적이 있습니다. 에, 비록 거칠고 단순한 화법으로 인한 논란에도 불구하고 한국 기득권층에 내재된 일종의 그 대미 종속성 문제를 정면으로 제기한 첫 번째 한국 지도자가 노무현 
노무현이었다는 사실은 부인할 수 없을 것입니다. 그의 비판 대상에서 한국 언론도 자유로울 수 없다고 봅니다. 한국 언론계에는 자이든 타이든 이른바 워싱턴 장학생들이 있는 게 사실이고 그들이 알게 모르게 한 동맹과 관련한 언론 보도에 영향을 미쳐온 것도 부인할 수 없는 사실입니다. 미국이라고 하는 기준과 일치하지 않으면 왠지 불안하다라는 인식은 미국 중심의 기존 질서가 흔들리면 개인적으로 손해를 볼수 있다는 개인적 이해와도 깊은 관련이 있다고 봅니다. 더구나 한국에서 반미는 친북과 거의 동의어로 취급되고 있습니다. 하지만 한미동맹 관계의 건강한 발전을 위해서는 미국에 대한 무비판적 편향은 지향해야 한다고 생각합니다. 호혜의 관점에서 한미 관계를 정상화한다는 자각과 각성이 한국 언론에 필요하다고 생각합니다. 이를 위해서는 무엇보다, 무엇보다 언론 본연의 역할에 충실할 필요가 있습니다. 한미동맹과 관련한 현안을 깊이 있게 파고드는 노력이 절실합니다. 현재 한미 간 최대 현안 중 하나로 제기되어 있는 고고도 미사일 방어체제 즉 사드의 한국 배치 논란과 관련해 한국 언론이 해야 할 가장 중요한 역할은 심층 취재를 통해 정확하고 객관적인 사실 보도를 하는 것입니다. 그것도 한 가지 측면만 아니라 다양한 측면을 입체적이고 종합적으로 보여줌으로써 독자와 시청자가 올바른 판단을 할수 있도록 해야 합니다. 아무리 시대가 달라지고 미디어 환경이 변해도 민주주의 국가에서 언론이 담당하는 기본적 사명은 변함이 없습니다. 사실 보도를 통해 유권자들의 현명한 판단을 도와주는 것입니다. 이 점에서는 한국과 미국 언론의 차이가 있을 수 없습니다. 한미동맹의 건강한 발전을 위해서는 언론의 역할이 더없이 중요하다고 생각합니다. 경청해 주셔서 감사합니다. 
uh, and naturally, uh, I think uh, p people in Korea or Japan or China, the countries I, I was based in for the longest periods of time, would assume I have American point of views that I bring to my profession. But Reuters uh, was British for the most part of my career and, and then became acquired by a Canadian outfit. So depending on the country um, we were in, we were treated as third party or even European media. So we weren't that sort of uh, media, media, that kind of thing. Um, we. It, it, it helped, it, it supports, what I wanted to say was, I, I personally as, as an individual have had a lot of sympathy in, uh, for you know, what, was, what Korea was trying to do in the No Mu Hyun era, dealing with, and, and Kim Dae Jong era, dealing with North Korea or vis-a-vis -vis its other neighbors and vis-a-vis -vis the United States. But professionally, I had no real per commitment to the alliance um, or promoting the alliance. I just basically, I always thought, and I think the journalist's job is to just stick to the professional codes and follow the facts. Uh, and that includes the deeper facts that sometimes get obscured in the rush to get a good story or in the excitement and color of dealing with North Korea. Uh, the, you know, at the end of the day, you, 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 you're, you're sort of like an observer. You're not even really an umpire. I think the umpire is the, the reader. So you're just basically trying to gather facts and be as you know, professional, as objective as possible when you're dealing with any, any country. And uh, that, that certainly was my aim and in, in experience in Korea. Now, when you talk about the, the Western media under the umbrella of which I, I also belonged, working in Korea, you do have, uh, I mean, a huge imbalance in the commitment of resources, personnel and resources uh, from between China and the United States. And I think that uh, the complaint or the observations that Mr. Bay made could, would be made by many Japanese colleagues as well. Maybe not China these days, where China f feels like it's creating a different center of, well, it is creating a different center of power in the world. But countries that do ha have long ties, historic post-war uh, ties and uh, Cold War ties with the United States will feel that relationship. It just, it lingers. Uh, the There are special features about the Western media in Korea that are not apparent to everybody, to the casual observer, and that would be that most of the staff of most of the big bureaus and offices of the Western media in Seoul are staffed by Koreans, K Korean Koreans or Korean Americans or, you know, uh, Korean Canadians, people with linguistic facility and knowledge. And uh, some of these faces you'll recognize for 20 years. Uh, I've, I've known them since the, almost the Seoul Olympics in 88, some, some of the same people, because they, you know, they, they have been doing that work for the longest period of time. They, they become the institutional memory of a given bureau. I can speak mostly from Reuters, but others are similar. And so some of the best work, you know, New York Times readers are very well served by Che Sang Hun, who had a long AP career before he joined the New York Times. And, you know, he, 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 he captures a lot of the nuances that somebody flying in from Tokyo periodically won't necessarily get, and uh, so there is there is a, a certain Korean sensibility baked into the news production that takes place in these uh, in the, in the bureaus of, of foreign news agencies in Seoul. That said, we have a different mission, and uh, there was never any sense that we this has to succeed. Now, as a human being, you want you know to see less suffering in North Korea. You want to see success. In, in, continued success for, by South Korea, I think, as a human being, someone with friends. But your, your mission is, is not to be negative necessarily, or it's just to tell it like it is and, and try to be, uh, well, in, in the case of wire journalism, newswire journalism, fast, faster than the other guy, but more important to be credibly accurate because you can squander a lot of credibility chasing rumors and you know deciding coming down on the wrong side of what ends up being an embar embarrassing affair. That's not unique to Korea, but sometimes the Korean news gathering uh, environment can can be sp special in that way um, so I think some of the, the some of the bigger challenges that uh, the Western and the US media face in terms of sustained interest in Korea is is sort of the business budgetary matters of keeping uh, people on the ground in, in 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 Korea and in other countries that are always important but not always urgent uh, I always felt that Korea was an ideal posting for a, a mid-career uh, journalist because of the range of topics you can cover in a given uh, span of a, a three-year assignment. In my case, the World Cup of football and all the exciting Be the Reds and the real breakthrough of the Korean pop singers and movie stars, that all happened about a decade or so ago. So there was there was news on so many fronts, advanced, uh, you know, economic, uh, advanced uh, corporate uh, entities, you know, like Hyundai and, and the big ones, 
as Samsung, as well as sort of developing country problems in terms of, say, labor strife or natural disasters or man-made disasters and things. So it was always the widest possible tablet of stories that one could in cover, including domestic politics, a very feisty democracy, uh, the legacies of their own history, that South Korea's own history, dealing with the, the dictatorship of the past, uh, always dealing with North Korea. So there's, uh, it's, it's, it's a plum assignment, but it, it, there, there comes periods where Korea doesn't uh, find itself in the news very often. Uh, if periods of, uh, I, I, uh, the only black eye I ever received in my adult life was covering the six party talks and it was, a, I, I took a camera, a running, excited running cameraman took a camera right in the eye and that was kind of fun, but that's my six party talk Chris Hill memory. But these days, you know, the six party talks sort of wound on for years and years and then to no real conclusion, they're frozen or they, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, my point is it's hard to sustain interest in such, um, in process stories like that. And now you, if you've had, uh, if you, were sort of schooled in studying North Korea, you, you, the conventional wisdom of this was that that uh, unusual regime would not survive the death of the founder, Kim Il-sung, which happened in 1994, and surely not the son, which happened, of course, uh, in 2011, the end of 2011. So, uh, but now you have another sort of circus that, that draws eyeballs, but to what end? It, sort of, it seems to be ep episodic, um, the way, you know, newspaper space and the way uh, the limited attention span of the wider American public, not the inside the beltway, you know, uh, switched on and, and, and news junkies like some of the people at our table here today or in this room, but the wider public, they do drift episodically from something unusual that may or may not involve Dennis Rodman to uh, whatever's happening in the Middle East to the next big thing, whether that, whatever that is. Now, where I would part uh, with Mr. Bay on, on some things is that there have been some game changers in terms of Korea's uh, you know, relative important, importance and interest to the wider world. And uh, I, uh, I'm speaking mainly of the soft power achievements of Korea. We, you don't need to mention that video again, but those kind of things s s matter far more than you'd realize on the surface because I think that uh, uh, Korea is taken more seriously and viewed from more angles uh, by the American public than ever before. You'll find whole websites and circles of community f uh, users on the internet f devoted to Korean soap operas or devoted to the various uh, boy and girl bands. And uh, all, of, all way of saying is that don't underestimate soft power and the way Korea really has come in, in, in 10 years or 15 years to punch way above its weight. And uh, it's the kind of thing you can dismiss as, oh, who cares about another pop video, or I'm sick of Gangnam Style and, blah, and all the parodies. You can dismiss it, but some people take it seriously. It, it's, it's pretty clear that China seems very exasperated that it cannot generate that kind of thing, and, and no amount of sort of government largesse and support can suddenly make you like a, the cultural output. It just comes so naturally, and I think uh, part of the sub-theme of this day's conference is promoting Korea, it, it's, it's not something that a bureaucrat or a well-intended foundation can necessarily always do the best. It just sort of happens. I think if, the, if cultural mandarins had their way, the more, more conventional, more polished uh, singers would have been the most famous Koreans uh, to make it around the world instead of uh, uh, Mr. Gangnam Style, who, you know, that's not, that's the, that's sort of the sloppy, accidental aspect of cultural success. And I think Korea has captured more than a little bit of that. I, th I don't think it's a passing phenomenon. It's not going to make um, North Korea turn around and behave differently tomorrow, but it's seeping into the consciousness of, of the neighbors. It, it helps with Japan. It, it keeps a certain residue of uh, goodwill in Japan towards Korea at a time when the you know, leadership uh, are, are not talking to each other and all of that. I think, ch like I say, China has to deal with the sense that Korea is a very popular country. They can't, practically, they just can't keep their kids from watching those uh, those shows or those videos. So um, I've become a big, uh, a very eager new student of soft power and, and just how it happens. And uh, the the management of the image is is, is something you, you have to worry about to the degree that you don't want very negatives to seep out. But I think you can't really bottle the the good stuff, the, the, the stuff you would like. 
uh, U.S. soft power also is eye-opening, even in a country like China, where you know the, the, the state media of China tends to demonize the U.S. and ever more so, I think, for the most part, or feature stories on the U.S. decline and all of that. They have an agenda, uh, but nonetheless, the the television market is dominated by those higher quality HBO type shows that everyone records and tapes it illegally. You just can't put a you can't bottle it and sell it if you're a government, but you also can't stop it. So you sort of have to let it happen. On that, on that note, I'll stop and leave things open for questions. Great. Thank you very much. Before we open the floor to questions, and I, I'm sure we're going to have a very lively discussion, um, we, have, we do have two commentators. Um, our first is uh, Chris Nelson, Senior Vice President of Samuels Inter uh, International Associates. Uh, he has a, 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 a past career in, in government with the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia um, and uh, as a senior advisor to the Senate Democratic Policy Committee. Um, uh, he is the author of the, the Nelson Report, which is uh, a, a must-read for international business and government executives uh, focused on Asia. Uh, he reports on, on the politics of trade as well as uh, legislative and policy developments. Um, he is a uh, graduate, graduate of, of, of Berkeley uh, and did some uh, postgraduate work at McGill University. Chris? Thanks. Thank I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, conference and topic, and, and I'm delighted to be asked to participate, uh, uh, particularly because uh, back in 2006, um, uh, our friends at Yonhap uh, flew me over, and I, I gave a paper at a conference uh, on the topic of how do U.S. policymakers get their information on Korea, and and I lost the damn thing, and I found it this morning finally in a file and reread it, and it's so interesting the kinds of things we're still worried about and the kinds of things we don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, Mr. Bai's paper was terrific, and what I did was bang out some notes on it, and and send them to Shihoko uh, late on Friday. So with your permission, I'm going to read uh, my no my commentary notes because. Uh, uh, Otherwise, it won't make much sense if we just sort of bounce around uh, talking about this or that. So uh, I should say, I, my career is checkered, to, to put it mildly. I started out as a reporter for a wire service for a United Press International, UPI, back when it was the equivalent of AP. I don't know what it is now. But uh, uh, I learned uh, the hard way uh, uh, you know, back in the 1967 uh, in New York. I wrote the radio news uh, for UPI. And in, uh, in some ways, I'm still writing the radio news. Uh, uh, if you get my report, it's spoken style. Uh, you're talking to me. Uh, uh, I worked for the Orlando Sentinel and others. So I actually have had real honest journalism jobs, not just uh, in my own newsletter. But I think one difference between me and Paul, for example, or, 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 or uh, my colleague, Mr. Bai, is that I am a journalist, reporter, commentator. Uh, I use my report to uh, to provide commentary on the news, not just what's going on, but here's what people who understand this stuff, here's what they think about it. Here's things I think, as the editor, you ought to read. So, so in, in some ways, I'm a bridge between a, a straight reporter, you know, the facts, and, uh, and the editor. So I call myself the editor of the Nelson Report. When you get gray hair, you can name it after yourself. So, um, uh, although I don't recommend the age part. Um, I have emailed to Shahoko my 2006 paper. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, send her an email and you can read it, uh, typos and all. Uh, and I've also emailed my talking points here, and I apologize in advance because I just nailed them out uh, Friday without necessarily uh, thinking it would, be, it would be for the ages. So, uh, but, but, but those are there too. So um, as I think Paul was saying, it, part of the problem is that for, for most uh, American media, most Western media, uh, uh, Korea means North Korea, and lately two big issues. How is South Korea getting along with China, and why are South Korea-Japan relations so damn horrible? Uh, uh, and they are. Uh, uh, so it, uh, an interesting and important subset of that becomes how the Korean-American community is exercising its newly found sense of civic involvement, uh, whether through comfort women monuments or campaigns to change, uh, you know, the East Sea and textbooks and all that. And one of the best examples of political journalism I've read anywhere, anywhere in the past year was Washington City Paper in March. 
did a fascinating profile of the Korean American who decided that he could make a difference, and he got the state of Virginia moving on the textbook issue. Well, I think we agree there's a hell of a lot more important things than the textbook, but but it was a fascinating look at how uh, uh, our two cultures are merging and. Korean Americans are behaving like Americans who happen to be Korean. You know, it, it's a really great piece of journalism. If you've not uh, read it, I, I commend it to you. The Washington City Paper, probably second week of March, a front page cover story on the on this guy. Uh, more broadly, however, um, uh, events in Korea per se, uh, unfortunately, tend not to be news for us here unless it's some heartbreaking thing like the ferry disaster. You know, that sort of human interest thing transcends nationality and national boundaries. Heartbreak is universal. Uh, and unfortunately, that you know, got a tremendous amount of coverage. But part of that has also included a look at Korean education system, at society, at how children are raised, how are they disciplined, why didn't those poor kids fight to get out. You know, so there is, within the horror of, of that event, there has been a fair amount of, of, of thoughtful, insightful journalism about Korea itself. Obviously, we'd rather not have that for the reason, but, but that happens. But really, for my, I think for most U.S. journalists and editors, routine, routine coverage of, of South Korea uh, is really seen as relevant only if it affects or may affect U.S. RK relations on North Korea, Japan, China, Russia, that kind of thing. And even that coverage tends to be spotty. So, so uh, uh, Mungook is absolutely right about asymmetry. Uh, whether some of his prescriptions uh, can really change that hard reality, I don't know. Uh, size matters, unfortunately. The hard fact of life is that while the U.S. has been and for the foreseeable future remains central to so much of RK politics, government, and so forth, the reverse is simply not true. Size matters. This is not an ego thing. It's a power thing. And editors react to that. They can't help it. Resources are thin, and they're getting thinner. Uh, so, you know, U.S. decision makers and the staff have learned to do their own legwork. Uh, uh, but there's where the good news comes in, especially compared to where we were back in 06. Uh, there's, Yonhap News does a terrific job of sending out uh, a variety of summaries. Uh, and to bring things really up to date, you've got these new listservs like 38 North and NK News and the like. Uh, uh, but by and large, they're focused on North Korea, aren't they, or how the U.S. is running things uh, or not running things on that, or the 123 agreement or that kind of thing. Uh, there's a very important new player in Seoul that is having a big impact here now for those of us who know about it and plug into it, and that's the Asan Institute. Uh, they do a terrific job of polling. You, know, you guys know this. Uh, they, they do papers. They have conferences. They do all kinds of things, and that's starting to make a real impact. They weren't around in 2006. They were a gleam in somebody's eye. Uh, you've got uh, prominent U.S. experts who post regularly online. They're very important to everything we do. Peterson uh, Institute's Mark, uh, Mark Noland, uh, his colleague from UCSD, Steph Haggard, uh, they post regular things. And uh, all of us who do Korea, Asia for, uh, for a living, we always check them out. Uh, Dave Maxwell at Georgetown uh, sends a regular uh, 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 you know, he, he reads Chosen Obo, he reads uh, John Daly, he reads John Happy, reads all the things he thinks we should read and don't have time, and he'll send out this article, and then he'll put a Dave Maxwell uh, series of comments uh, up on top that uh, I should be so lucky I could get away with that, uh, get away with stuff in the report. But Dave noticed it. So there's all kinds of stuff out there for American decision makers, Capitol Hill people, scholars, anybody uh, to find things out. So that's that's the really good news. But I think there's a, there's a difference between what's out there and what's going to make it into the newspaper. And I think some of that's what we're talking about. It, it, the, the grassroots reporting, if you will, the, the work done by the Korean nationals who staff the various bureaus is terrific. But are you going to see it in the Times? Not often, you know. Uh, you see it in the Post? Hardly ever. You know, that kind of stuff. So there's, you know, there is asymmetry or, or a problem in that sense. Um, you know, um, but really, in some ways, if you look at U.S. media today, because of budget, uh, with the exception of the Times, a little bit of the Post, and the World Street Journal, we're every damn one of us relying on that enormous wandering tribe of Australians and Brits and, and AFP guys and, and you know, uh, uh, these freelancers that you hear all the time on NPR and on CNN. They're fabulous, but they're not Americans. They're people who are out, who've decided to make a living being, you know, wandering journalists, and, they, and it's fabulous. Suddenly, it's not the New York Times guy. It's not the Washington Post guy, uh, or, or occasionally uh, the gal. Um, so, uh, 
Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, I should be talking more about the paper. Um, I think the point about um, the American effect on the ROK writers and editors, um, I, think, I think it's an important point. But I also remember uh, very clearly in the 80s when I was doing my report for a Japanese company, um, there was a whole generation of Washington correspondents from Japan who, for the first time in their lives, learned how to do objective journalism about government. They never really had that experience back in Tokyo. They had nothing but the press club, and if you were a bad boy or a bad girl, you didn't get invited to the press club. You know, so they, they were taught by Washington Post investigative reporters and the New York Times and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, it's true there's an America effect, but I think the, the overall raising the level of professionalism of journalism as a profession itself has benefited from that. So, uh, 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 good. Um, in my talking points, I said a lot of rude things about the Sankei Shimbun, uh, 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 but uh, I did it because I think we do need to worry about uh, this idea that the media is somehow an adjunct of the government. Uh, you know, the prosecution of the Sankei Shimbun reporter is reprehensible. In essence, uh, he didn't apologize enough, uh, uh, so he's being prosecuted. That should scare all of us as journalists. It, it, it's a real problem. Um, and I also, well, let's see. Um, we'll skip over my sarcastic suggestion that the editors of Chosen Nobo and the Sankai should be thrown into an arena made to fight it out. Um, because sometimes sarcasm doesn't translate. Um, back to, back to uh, uh, Hmong books. Excellent paper. Mark Lippert's dog story. I liked that story. Uh, it's a good human interest stuff. And, and I do think had Ambassador Han or Ambassador Han had some colorful pet story, it would have been picked up by U.S. Uh, media, especially if there was some good video. So, yeah, you know, even though a, a former minister like Ambassador Han was named to Washington, at best there would be uh, some mention in Al Kamen's column or something than a diplomat or, or my report. Uh, but, you know, it's, for the reasons Paul mentioned, it's, it's just not a big story uh, as far as American editors are concerned. Uh, it, it, it just isn't, and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, I think, however, uh, 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 Mungbuk's real point of, is about anointing into the realm of the gods, you know, for Korean journalists coming back from Washington, is that it risks reinforcing a distorting tendency for Korean journalism to take on an American bias, a perhaps unconscious assumption that right, in quotes, is what U.S. standards say. Yeah, and I hadn't really thought about it in that way before. Uh, and uh, in any event, I'm not one to judge. You know, that's, that's up to you guys. Uh, you're the customers and the citizens, and, and, uh, uh, and it's something to think about. But I can certainly see how the bias I exists. Uh, and it certainly relates to uh, a rant you don't want to hear from me about the Sankei Shimbom and, and Prime Minister Abi and the history deniers, but in any event. Um, let's see. I was surprised, pleasantly, at the praise of U.S. government efforts to sponsor Korean journalists, and I'm glad to learn of it. Uh, my fault for not knowing. Uh, uh, for sure, the ROK could do more in that regard. There are some good programs that need more emphasis. Uh, Arang TV, for example, brings over small groups of foreign uh, journalists to tour the country to meet normal people, you know, not just the international English-speaking elites, but actual real Koreans. Uh, amazing concept. Uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the tour two years ago, and for the first time in my life, uh, I got outside of Seoul. Uh, I've been coming to Korea since 1977 before most of you were born. And previously, my trip consisted of, of uh, the airport, to the hotel, to the foreign ministry, to the trade ministry, to the prime minister's office, to the bus, to the DMZ, uh, Norks, back to, you know. And uh, I did that for, for 35 years. I finally got outside of Seoul. It's a great country. I really had a good time. So, so we, you know, we, you need to do more of that. Um, I'm really glad to hear that Ambassador Sung Kim had a good program of working for Korean journalists. And I'm sure that Mark Lippert will do an even better job, although that'll get him in trouble with this White House. Uh, uh, Lippert was one of the few Obama confidants who ever tried to have a responsible professional relationship with mere journalists. Uh, I have to say, uh, if, if Sung Kim was running a good uh, outreach program to Korean journalists in Korea, I wish to hell the Obama administration would reach out to American journalists, but that's another issue. Um, uh, the dearth of American journalists with real Korean experience like Don Oberdorfer. My God, do we all miss Don. You know, he was a wonderful guy and a mentor to all of us. And as you probably most know, he's in really bad shape and, and, and probably not, not long for it. So it's a real shame. And it's too bad. 
uh, and I don't see anybody of his stature and experience stepping forward to fill that role, but maybe there's somebody there that, uh, you know, who's coming on up. But uh, we should all say a prayer for Don, that's for sure. Um, as an American journalist, all I can say about, about my book's reference to the dangers of groundless arrogance by ignorant U.S. journalists is to say I'm sorry when it includes me, and I'm sure it does. And, and uh, by God, he's 10,000% right about the distorting effects of ignorance, tunnel vision, and the rest, like for all the reasons that we all know. So that's right. We've got to be conscious of it. I totally agree it would be great if Korean language journalists could be encouraged and developed. But, you know, that takes money and focus, lots of money for travel, scholarships, advertising. Make it fun and attractive and a viable career alternative. Build it and they will come. Uh, it isn't just going to happen uh, 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 because Korea is an interesting place. It's going to take a concerted effort and organization. Uh, interesting point that you make about the danger in Korea that criticizing the U.S. is seen as being pro-North Korean. Uh, there is some historical justification for that, let's face it. Uh, Ultra-liberal political criticism in Korea has sometimes managed to forget uh, that there is a place called North Korea and they're kind of threatening nasty stuff. Uh, so, you know, it, it, if you only focus on American uh, hypocrisies and past historic outrages, uh, whether it was the Korean War or support for the Park dictatorship, you know, you kind of miss what the context was. So, yeah, that's true, but let's not push it too far. Final points in the paper eloquently explain why depth and sophistication matter. And when we're writing about North Korean nukes or theater, missile defense, or whatever, we really better know what we're talking about or have the professional sense to seek out those who do. Uh, and my final sort of point is, you know, the media does have a role in public diplomacy, agenda setting, and message delivery, but public diplomacy is not the media's job. Uh, uh, it's not something, unfortunately, that I don't think either Prime Minister Abe or President Park quite, uh, it's a distinction they don't quite get. And for sure, as we heard from China's President Xi, he doesn't give a damn about it. He thinks the media should be punished if they don't play the game. So um, uh, uh, those are some of the thoughts I had uh, stimulated by this really terrific paper, and I, and I thank you for, for taking the time to do it. Um, and with that, I'm glad to see Dong Min. I haven't seen her in a couple of years. She did a great job when she was here, and so it seems to have survived. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Okay, and our, our finer, final um, uh, uh, commentator <laughs> is uh, uh, Lee Dong Min, uh, uh, who is she is the uh, the head of the English Economic News section with with Yonhap um, Yonhap News. Uh, she um, uh, also, like Chris, uh, graduated from UC Berkeley. Uh, and then she was here in, in D.C. Uh, doing her M.A. at, at Georgetown. Um, started with the Korea Herald in 87 and then moved over to Yonhap in 1990, um, uh, starting uh, with, with uh, inter international relations and inter-Korean relations uh, in the English news section, uh, then moved on to, um, uh, to become the first ever correspondent of Yonhap in English news in Washington, um, but is now back in Korea. Uh, heading the the English economic news section, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, let me just start out by saying I couldn't agree more about the asymmetry that Mr. Bay pointed out about the level of access, the difference that the South Korean media gets in the U.S. and the American journalists get in South Korea. Let me just start with my personal experience when I was in Washington. This would be like eight or nine years ago, and I'm certain that circumstances have changed much since then. But back in those days, I had to apply a day in advance in order to attend a briefing at the White House. I had to fax in my personal information, my social security number, and so on and so on. And when I did arrive the following day, I was shut out, and the reason was there was no intern available who could escort me from the main gate to the briefing room. I thought, hey, I, I can walk. I know my way around. And the person at the gate said, no, 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 this is a White House rule. You have to be escorted. But no one was available, so I was shut out that day. And after that kind of experience, believe me, after three years here, I was more anti-U.S. than I was ever <laughs> Now, with that, um, was that Bush or, or early Obama? That was post. That was Bush. That was really? Bush. Yes, wow. it was. Yeah. Obama, I believe it. <laughs> but, you know, no one let me anywhere near the building. But anyway, um, despite all that, let me try to 
try really hard to add a note of um, positiveness into this. Um, I think this sort of monopoly of the mainstream South Korean newspapers and other outlets and so-called opinion leaders who are um, so pro-U.S., uh, this kind of monopoly, I think I'm seeing a little bit of a break from that, and I think it's very good. Um, the Internet age has very dramatically changed the way news is distributed and consumed in South Korea, especially with the younger people. Nobody buys newspapers anymore. Of course, they're, they're read you know, through the Internet, online, other mediums. But what I see my younger colleagues do at office when they try to search or, or go read a newspaper, what they do is they just turn on the smartphone, they type in a search word, and you will get like a long list, not just by the mainstream media, but these budding, not well-known online outlets. They, they offer very different variety of perspective on a single news item. And I think that's very positive. I would really like to encourage people to just go online and instead of just picking certain newspapers, go through it all. Um, and what this has done is created a like, group of, a, a segment in South Korean news consumers um, who really have wised up. I say wise up because these people know that a certain newspaper or a certain outlet has have has an agenda of their own. Each newspaper has, you know, th they stand right of the center or the left of the center, and people know. And when they write a certain story on a certain subject, people know. Oh well, this newspaper has a, a conservative agenda. That paper has a liberal agenda. So people have learned to, I think, filter out that aspect of each media. So they know what to pick, they know what they want to pick, and they kind of interpret the news in their own way, which I think is very positive development uh, in the media circumstance in South Korea. Um, of course, there is negative side effect. There is just over flood of news. And so much of the news has circulated outside of the mainstream media is very unvetted. So there is a danger of just wild rumors just going around and just going around uncontrollably. And yet, I think this is something that we have to go through as we mature as news consumers. Um, so there are segments that this mainstream media is missing. And this non-mainstream media is sometimes really strikes the right chord with the public. Um, and I think if the U.S. really wants to reach out um, to, to South Korean public through public diplomacy or through other means, I think they have to make, take note of this, that there is something going on in South Korea other than through the mainstream media. And um, they really should perhaps try to reach out to those kind of outlets instead of just running this uh, small coterie of uh, US, a pro-U.S. or U.S centric um, journalists. That's my first point. And um, my second point is, um, I think there's a lot of credit going to recent U.S. Um, ambassadors to, to Seoul, like starting from Christopher Hill, and then Kathleen Stevens, and, and Sung Kim. They've all done very much to, to reach out to people, to, to be friendly. They really put a friendly face to U.S. envoys, unlike before. Know, through their blogs, you know, just if you go through the photo gallery of, of Mr. Sun Kim's um, activities in Scar, you you will see him just everywhere. <laughs> He's been everywhere, which I think really speaks a lot about the success of um, U.S. public diplomacy. Um, and yet, as I said at the beginning, the kind of news source, news sources that the Korean media gets in Washington and even in Seoul. It's very unbalanced. Despite all this very approachable image that the U.S. is creating through their envoys, when it comes to hard news, news coverage, we are not getting it. We are not getting that kind of access that we need and we require, really. Um, even on is uh, uh, immediate issues, we are not getting what U.S. is trying to say, what the kind of message that U.S hopes to send to the South Korean public, even a thought, even on the wartime operational control, transfer of the OPCON. We are getting what South Korean media is giving, the, the spin that South Korean media is giving to the issues. But if you really think about it, what does Washington has to say about it? 
I mean, is Washington interested in getting its message out to the South Korean people about these kind of issues? The Western media is, is not interested. I have hardly seen a coverage of OPCON or even Thad, perhaps in a bigger perspective. But for, for South Korean public, the kind of questions that South Korean news readers want to ask the U.S., we are not getting answers to. Um, we get sort of like a secondary interpretation, the, the kind of interp interpretation we get from the U.S. media. But the kind of questions that we really want to ask, we don't get answer to. And I think that's really a, a serious problem. It's something that should be addressed by U.S. administration officials. Talk to the Korean press, press more closely um, and on more immediate basis instead of giving a, like a big overview of, oh, our, our Asia policy, our, our Korea policy. We need quick answers to immediate issues that we have at hand, and we are not getting that. Um, and let me just, my last point is this um, China factor. As Mr. Bay said, even the Park Geun-hye administration, I think, is still more inclined to to, excuse me, <clears throat> more inclined to um, U.S.-based alliance and so on. But I think this China, this rising China factor, has really taken on a, a new twist. Um, it's, I, I was talking to my friend the other day, and he was saying, um, this is like having a very comfortable, long-term, almost like a lifelong neighbor right, uh, living right next door to you. So you're so comfortable with them, you're so settled in with that family. But then a new neighbor has moved in, and this new neighbor is kind of really interesting, kind of attractive, you know, he's, he's bringing sort of a new excitement to this neighborhood. I think China is sort of doing that. And um, despite this rock solid South Korea US alliance, China is sort of like working into our daily lives, to South Korea's daily lives. Um, there was an interesting news the other day that um, there are now these bookstores are selling more China language lesson books uh, on learning Chinese. They're selling more of that Chinese textbooks than US, um, uh, than textbooks for learning English. The, the sales has somehow tipped to the other side. Um, and obviously these days, this, um, South Korean parents decided that China, chi having uh, being able to speak Chinese is the next big thing in education. So they're sending their children to China instead of the U.S. Because in China, if they go to international schools, they can pick up both English and Chinese. So that kind of shift is <laughs> going the other way too. Um, and of course, the business side and the trade side, China is like so big as you can see from the recent news of South Korea, China agreeing on a, a, a free trade agreement. Um, so with that kind of backdrop, with China coming into the picture, I think the South Korea-U.S. alliance is getting a new twist. And from the U.S. point of view, I think they would have to like change their approach to South Korea as well. Um, there is like a domino effect because of China. China is asserting itself more and more, and China is kind of taking the lead in, region, in regional issues, like setting up their own regional bank, pursuing their own regional trade blocks, um, their own regional security dialogue, and so on. So I think in the long run, within the South Korea-U.S. alliance, I think U.S. Is, won't be able to have that much for granted. There will be less and less of what U.S. can take for granted when it comes to um, having South Korea as a rock solid ally. Um, and I think that's a new factor in, in this relationship. And with that, I'll turn it over to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. We've got an excellent, uh, excellent panel here. Um, uh, do you want to immediately respond to some of their comments before we open it up to the floor? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Uh, do you want to start? Uh, <coughs> echo to speechy, Grugu, Chris, and Dongmin's uh, uh, comment uh, and presentation. 아주 잘 들었습니다. 아주 솔직하고 또 그리고 아주 정확하고 또 굉장히 날카로운 그런 지적들이 많았다고 생각합니다. 사실 제가 그 오늘 발표를 하면서 그저 자신이 
이게 아주 객관적인 발표라고는 저도 생각하지 않습니다. 한국 기자로서 또 한국 기자의 한 사람으로서 발표하는 것 뿐이지 제가 한국 언론 전체를 대표해서 발표하는 건 물론 아닙니다. 그 특히 그 크리스 넬슨의 지적 중에 제가 억셉트할 수밖에 없는 그런 지적들도 일부 있고요. 에, 우선 지금 그세분 말씀 중에 우선 제가 꼭 이건 리스판스를 해야 되겠다라고 생각하는 건몇 가지만 지적하겠습니다. 그 아까 그 저하고 같은 한국의 언론계 동료인 그 이동민 무장께서 어, 저 지적을 아까 했습니다. 그 한국 대중들은 미국의 한미 동맹과 관련한 중요 이슈에 대한 입장이 관 뭔지 이 궁금하다. 그러니까 아까 그러면서 예컨대 전자권 전환이라든가 그 사드 문제라든가 이런 거에 대해서 미국 정부가 과연 어떤 입장을 가지고 있는지 한국 대중들은 알고 싶은데 에, 한국 언론을 보면 잘알 수가 없다. 그거는 그러니까 이제 제가 보기에는 두 가지 책임이 있다고 봅니다. 하나는 에, 첫째는 아무래도 그거는 우리 언론 자신의 문제라고 생각합니다. 특히 그건 바꿔 얘기하면 워싱턴에 있는 한국 기자들의 문제라고 생각하는데 에, 그러니까 지금 제가 보면 아까 제가 발표해서 말씀드렸듯이 한국에서 워싱턴에 파견된 기자들은 아주 유능한 기자들입니다. 그 유능한 기자들이 워싱턴에 왔으면 은 자기 존재 증명을 해야 되거든요. 그러니까 뭐든지 아무튼 남과 다른 기사, 특종이 됐든 아니면 새로운 시각이 됐든 이런 것을 계속 여러 가지 다양한 방법을 통해 서울의 기사를 통해 알려야 되는데 에, 그러다 보니까 그 기자들 간의 경쟁이 아주 치열합니다. 어, 그 경쟁이 치열하다 보니까 어, 그런데 그 미국 그이뭐 어, 백악관부터 시작해서 국무부, 국방부 등 미국의 어떤 취재원에는 접근이 잘안 되고요. 그러니까 그러다 보니까 단편적인 사실을 가지고 어, 기사를 쓰, 쓰거나 취재가 불충분한 상태에서 기사를 쓰거나 어, 그러다 보면은 사실과 다른 기사가 날 수도 있고 또 왜곡된 기사가 날 수도 있고 이런 문제점이 있습니다. 바로 이런 점 때문에 사드 문제라든가 전자권 전환 문제에 대해서 어, 한국 기자들이 아무리 유능하고 취재를 열심히 해도 어, 취재가 안 되는 부분이 있고 그 부분은 이제 바로 미국의 문제라고 생각합니다. 그러니까 미국의 그 뉴스 소스가 될수 있는 데서 한미동맹과 관련한 중요 이슈에 대해서는 어, 아까 그 이동민 부장이 지적한 대로 좀더 즉각적이고 어, 충분한 그런 설명이라든가 브리핑이라든가 이런 걸 해줄 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. 그렇게 함으로써 한미동맹 사이에 생길 수 있는 갭, 균열 이런 걸 막, 막을 수 있다고 생각합니다. 그러니까 한국 언론 자신의 노력도 필요하고 또 미국의 그 뉴스 소스가 될수 있는 곳에 그런 노력도 동시에 같이 필요한 부분이라고 생각을 하고요. 그 점에서 이동민 부장이 아주 정확하고 훌륭한 지적을 했다고 생각하고요. 그 다음에 아까 그 크리스 넬슨 말씀 중에 이 공공 외교는 언론의 역할이 아니다. 이제 그런 지적을 하셨는데 저도 물론 공감입니다. 언론은 언론의 역할이 있고 공공 외교는 그 외교의 또 역할이고 그건 서로 분야가 다른 거고요. 제가 말씀드린 것은 언론이 공공 외교의 한 축으로 언론이 공공 외교를 해야 한다는 뜻이 아니라 어, 요즘 에, 시대에서 공공 외교의 중요한 대상 중에 하나가 언론이란 뜻이었고 언론의 역할은 아까 말씀드린 대로 이그 정확한 정보를 가진 enlightened and informed electorate 그 voter를 언론이 만드는 데 기여하는 것 그게 저는 언론의 민주국가에서 언론의 역할이라고 생각합니다. 어, 그 다음에 그 아까 그 넬슨 어, 크리스 넬슨도 얘기를 하고 그폴 에커트 씨도 얘기를 했는데 그 사이즈 문제를 말씀하셨습니다. 그러니까 어쩔 수 없지 않느냐 그렇습니다. 그걸 제가 부인하는 거 아닙니다. 그 저도 다 인정하고요. 그 미국이라고 하는 사이즈와 한국의 사이즈가 다르기 때문에 그 사이즈 문제는 어쩔 수 없는 것이고 그것이 언론에 반영되는 측면에서 언론의 어떤 물적, 인적, 리소스 문제, 배분 문제에서 차이가 날 수밖에 없다는 것을 충분히 이해하고 어, 인정합니다. 그리고 저도 그걸 부인하는 건 아니고요. 그런데 저는 거기에 대해서는 이렇게 대답하고 싶습니다. Uh, size matters, but uh, quality also matters. 퀄리티도 중요하다고 생각합니다. 바로 그, 그 부분을 지적한 거고요. 그래서 적어도 한국 문제를 다루는 미국의 기자라면 은 지금보다는 좀더 한국에 대한 전문 지식, 역사적 배경, 맥락, 또 특히 언어 능력 이런 걸좀 갖췄으면 어떨까 그런 점을 지적했습니다. 이상 마치겠습니다. 
Yeah. Um, I totally agree. Again, ten thousand um, uh, percent. You know, the, it's disheartening to hear uh, so thoroughly from from Dong Min, especially uh, how, in a sense, shut out you feel, uh, and. Um, I, I, maybe Paul had a, a different experience uh, with Reuters, but um, you know I've been in, in Washington full time since 1970, and I've been writing my newsletter since about 1985, 1986, and I have never had a more difficult time covering an administration than I have had in this administration, and in many cases it was staffed by people that I have known since we were just punk kids together, you know, these are friends and they still won't tell me what the hell is going on. So uh, this is in no way a consolation or an excuse, but simply say the job of journalism in this administration I don't think has ever been harder because, and this is quoting myself now screaming at Danny Russell when he was at the NSC, I said, Danny, you know, I asked you a question about whatever it was and you didn't answer it. Then, so I got it wrong in my report, and then I hear you're pissed because you thought, didn't think my report was accurate. Well, now, wait a minute. You know, I asked you to help me get it right, and you didn't, so I didn't get it right. So whose fault is that? Why is that my fault? You know, and, and I don't say that to whine or money. It's just, it's just it, you know, that's the constant journalist lament. It's always, you know, if the policeman won't give you the idea of the guy in the accident, you know, then you can't get it in your story, you know. Uh, but this administration has been harder than ever. So uh, that's why I was glad to hear that there was so much outreach going on in South Korea because they sure as hell don't reach out to us here. Yep. Uh, and, um, and I've had this conversation with, uh, uh, even David Sanger feels like he doesn't get real access. And I'm thinking, my God, are you kidding me? But, uh, you know, uh, e even the Times guys complain about it. Uh, so uh, uh, don't feel alone. Don't feel that you're being discriminated against. This is a problem we've all got. Uh, uh, so, anyway. Well, it's funny, uh, if, I, if I may, Chris sort of shot me down. My uh, sympathetic response to Dong Min, and I, fe I feel for her, was that even within uh, papers of record, and there's a certain perceived pecking order in the White House, and I was going to name David's, that the New York Times, I mean, from Reuters' point of view, well, we're not the New York Times, and therefore, you know, there's a certain, but, but I, I have to admit, I've heard these complaints from other uh, reporters, and, and Koreans, but others, uh, f people from China as well. Now, there's a Chinese media or a different beast, for the most part, than S South Korea's media, and there's, there's issues there, but nonetheless, the degree, and it just seems that they almost need a, a you know, not, they can't, you can't have a spokesman for every country, but they need to, they meaning, say, the State Department, the Pentagon, the administration, they need to be less tone deaf to these needs. Uh, I used to always, uh, uh, sort of, as Chris mentioned with uh, Danny Russell, uh, I, when I worked in authoritarian countries like China, I said, well, look, we, we're going to write a, a story Anyway, we're not going to make up things, but the point is, isn't it better to have your positions and your points of view, uh, you know, provided uh, rather than nothing, no comment? I think sometimes an informed or a decisive no comment can stand up for a, da a daily story you want to build on it later. But the point is, if you cover all your bases, it's just it's just good, good PR sense to... Uh, you know, to work the Korean press. And, and, and as Mr. Bay said, there's, there tends to be, I mean, we do forget how busy the inboxes of high officials are and they're responsible for numerous countries. And then when you factor in an electoral calendar, I always thought, I mean, Reuters is, is recently is a prestigious news organization that a, a, you know, a congressman of, without worldwide fame would be interested in talking to me and maybe even flattered. I, I never thought that, but I thought, well, you know, it, it would work. But typically, I'm not I'm not writing for the audience that he considers the most important down in back in Ohio or in Pennsylvania. So, you know, international, being quoted internationally doesn't really pay the bills for him, so to speak. So there, there is always, uh, you know, narrow interest and in the urgent and immediate, immediate taking importance over the important. And Korea is always one of those, and U.S. are okay. It's, it's often urgent when you have nuclear missile tests and things like this. It's often urgent, but it's 
always important. It's just not always a sexy news story that we can we can hang something on. I just wanted to quickly say, some of the Obama people do get it. Mark Lippert was helpful whenever he could be. Uh, this will get him in trouble. Glenn Davis was enormously helpful uh, whenever he could be. Uh, Jeff Bader, uh, whom I had known since we were both 20-something, uh, was fabulous on the NSC because he understood. If I got it wrong, it made his job harder. Mm-hmm. You know? So, so you know, uh, but by and large, those guys were an enormous ex- exception. But you know, we're, we're lucky Mark is, is now in Seoul, and I'm hoping he'll... Uh, you'll see why uh, he's liked and respected uh, 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 for how he handles uh, uh, these kinds of things. Great. Let's take some questions from the floor. I'm going to take uh, maybe two or three um, uh, gentlemen in the middle there. Uh, just wait for the mic, and then please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Richard Scores. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. I spent um, the bulk of my career in public diplomacy, a large part of it in East Asia, and um, Uh, Thank you all for your uh, very insightful comments, and uh, I commiserate with your complaints. Um, Having dealt with it from my side, I was a spokesman uh, for the U.S. delegation to the four-party talks, dealt directly with a number of the frustrations you were all dealing with uh, on your side of it. But first, let me uh, mention... uh, uh, to add to Mr. Myungbok Pai's uh, comprehensive list, uh, he overlooked uh, a very important component of the U.S. Uh, official effort uh, to uh, inform foreign publics, and that is uh, the Foreign Press Center. It's on the eighth floor, a couple of blocks from here in the foreign, in the National Press Building. Uh, it's housed uh, among many offices. Uh, in my day, when I was the Asia desk there, uh, I had a significant component of Korean bureaus, uh, press, and uh, TV, and uh, um, had enjoyed uh, numerous lunches on their expense accounts. So uh, I, uh, th- it's a two-way street. But that foreign press center is a uh, one-stop operation uh, run by the State Department, staffed by professional foreign service officers like me. My job was to get the foreign correspondent an interview, uh, to organize briefings with uh, s- uh, policy principals uh, from Congress, the DOD, Pentagon, from state, get them into offices, get them around the country. We had a significant uh, budget to do that. Uh, which expanded during uh, uh, major events like the U.S. election cycles. We would bring correspondents to, um, to uh, polling places or uh, grassroots organizing facilities and so on. And we would concentrate on area-specific issues. Um, uh, one example I can give you is during the um, uh, crisis of uh, drift net fishing in the Pacific, that issue came to the fore I organized uh, a number of uh, uh, Asian correspondents, including several Koreans, uh, took them out to the Northwest, introduced them to family-owned businesses, Indian tribes, and uh, uh, local officials and uh, protest organizations like Greenpeace, uh, so they could report accurately back to their bureaus on the effects of drift net fishing on the U.S. Uh, in a very localized way. So that, that's an example of what the Foreign Press Center uh, still does, and uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, secondly, in terms of your current frustrations, I think that some of it sounds to me like I haven't been officially active in uh, more than a decade, but sounds to me like what's happened is this uh, gravity shift away from the policy making uh, used to be in the State Department or DOD, and the White House was sort of like a uh, traffic cop. And now it looks like the White House is the only place you can go. And because those folks are uh, coming out of campaigns and they're more in a battleground campaign mode and take uh, years, if n- ever, to get out of that mode. They tend to be much more um, um, uh, incommunicative, especially with foreign press, because as one staffer once told me, look, Koreans don't vote. 
you know, what do I want to talk to that person for? So uh, if you come from that, that uh, background and now you're in, in uh, a position of dealing with the media and you still have the remnants of that, I, uh, that's how I explain it to myself because people like me, uh, my job is to get you access, uh, get you, if that intern's not there, I would go down to the White House and get you in. I'd walk you in there. <laughs> so these, these folks are, uh, they're just carrying the, that baggage, and I think it's a larger issue where the policy yeah. center is now located, concentrated in a very small ca uh, cabal of folks and not, not particularly uh, trained to deal with the media. Thank you. Uh, we had a question up. Um, well, a couple of questions. Um, let's, let's actually, I, I saw three hands, uh, starting with um, Dr. Kim and then Jack and then. Well, yeah, uh, Taiwan Kim from Korea National Development Academy. My question is to, to any of uh, the speakers. Well, obviously, from the perspective of uh, professional journalism, uh, as, uh, as Chris Nelson said, I mean, uh, public diplomacy is uh, definitely not a job of uh, media or journalism. But then when we come to the function, the uh, objective functions of journalism, we cannot deny there is a very important public diplomacy function given the fact that among the important capabilities or uh, even prerogatives of journalism, um, you know, uh, the agenda setting capability and more importantly, agenda framing capability, yep. which has a, a enormous uh, public diplomacy repercussions. Then my question is very simple. Uh, how would you, as, as a professional journalist, how would you reconcile the objective function, public diplomacy function and uh, your professional uh, journalist ethic? Great. Okay. Let's take just quickly two more questions. Um. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this uh, fantastic panel and being on it. And I'm sure um, that's... Uh, um, uh, that panel seat is like a <laughs> needle and thorn, but uh, nonetheless, um, I really enjoyed this panel. Uh, my question is, as journalists who are considered insiders uh, of that industry, um, you mentioned the problem with the access. Uh, so um, if you could make some suggestions to decision makers and uh, maybe um, stakeholders of public diplomacy, uh, what recommendations would you make so that you would have better access? And of course, the gentleman from the State Department, um, he is someone that who was willing to walk down to the White House and escort you himself. But it all depends who's on, on that seat, who's at that desk. Uh, <laughs> it, it really depends on that person. So um, if you could make some suggestions to not only just depending on the individual officer, but to make the whole system better so that all journalists could have better access, I would appreciate that, and also uh, maybe the journalist, the industry as a whole is a very competitive uh, one, I understand, but maybe um, the journalist, as far as, as competitive as it may be, but for access, I think maybe uh, journalists need to cooperate each and help each other to gain better access, and it's just my thought, thank you. Could you actually hand it back, um, just two rows there, if you could, can you reach that? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for all panelists. My name is Yuji An. I'm a master's student at GW studying public diplomacy and global communication. I really enjoyed all four of your commentaries. And this will be actually directed to all four since all four of your different settings. So on Yonhap, as I see a bilingual student reading both Korean and English newspaper, I see Yonhap's feed constantly coming up more and more on the English side of coverage. And this is great from the information fl outflow. However, I've also heard that Yonhap nowadays is becoming a dominant force that it only gives a single frame since it's already prepackaged, it's already in English. It's a good format for the Western um, you know, outlets to just absorb and say, this is what's happening in Korea. I would like to hear your thoughts on how this dominant role of Yonhap and how it grew to be in the Korean to English media and what your thoughts are. Gosh. <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, yeah, you want to go? Well, yeah. I uh, appreciate it and welcome all three of the questions. Dr. Kim, you, you raised some good points. In my case, uh, I never thought, I, I, I 
I felt like I bear, bore on my shoulders the, the responsibility to get things right because you naturally can move into agenda setting mode. Um, Reuters has had st just traditionally been a more staid news agency, not sens sensationalistic. And sometimes it, in the old days before the internet where everything kind of goes out at once and different people do different things, back when there was no internet, we used to do client what we called client interviews and client visits. And we'd go to newspapers, and that was not just in the U.S., but like say in, even in Seoul or Beijing. And we'd go to clients and ask them how, what they liked about what we were doing, what criticisms they had, what, what they found lacking and all of that. And one of the things they always said about Reuters was we, we tend to wait on some, if it's dicey, iffy news and it comes out on brand B, we'll wait to see if Reuters has it, and then we'll make a safe decision, or in, in some cases, financial investments. So that you feel that weight on your shoulders that you don't want to go wildly off base in something if you can't stack it up. So in that sense, I always thought it was I was doing the best service to explain the ramifications of, a, of, of something in terms of winners, losers, and what it does. Uh, let's take, for example, the Chorus FTA, uh, a long process that you know, required a lot of attention over, you know, sporadically, not not day in and day out for three years, but periods when, you know, votes were taking place or lobbying was taking place or uh, people were are, are protesting against it, that kind of thing. And I always thought, uh, you know, I don't personally have a vested interest and in, my news agency doesn't other than just to try to explain the politics, the try to put a number on the economic benefits uh, to you know, and, and, and when... Uh, when possible, and go into sectors. So, so these are winners, these are losers. Sort of a financial, the economic side of things. But also, then uh, you know, you owe your readers the context of uh, this is also an important um, uh, building block of a, of a new bilateral relationship with uh, between the United States and South Korea. So all of that, and then the broader context of other competitive trade blocks merging, centered on China, for example. Those sort of those 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 sort of things. Uh, to the lady with the unhop question, it's never good practice to simply absorb what is said by another um, news organization into yours. There's times when you have to do it, it you're on the speed. Uh, let's say a plane crashes in the mountains of in, in somewhere in Korea. Chances are that Yonhap or, or YTN television, they're going to be the first ones with something. And then as long as you handle it and source it cr properly, as for the first tidbit. But while you're doing that and producing and, and publishing, you've got people on the, manning the phones, or womaning the phones, and you're going to uh, be hitting, yes, exactly. You're going to be hitting those same, those same sources. So you can't just, yeah. it, it, the only time you can kind of import something part and parcel is an official statement from say KCNA or sometimes the Chinese state media when it's, it is the word of the government and you can identify it as such. But to just, I mean, you're not talking about plagiarism. You're just talking about a sort of absorbing. Uh, I think what you, you what you end up doing on a, in, in a daily basis, if you're in a, bu a busy bureau like Seoul, is reading, going for the highlights. The uh, you know uh, what are the top stories of the day? What are people talking about? Which ones are urgent? Which ones will have international traction? Which ones you can sort of file away for something interesting later, kind of thing. Um, but you know, you do if you're working in a foreign country, you you, you would have to. I'm sure. I'm sure Mr. Bay and his colleagues, those those in the bureau staffing the bureau for the Jungang Ilbo, here are you know perusing the New York Times probably before they go to bed. The time zone difference makes for some dynamics as well in terms of what you you can tack on and you know w w what you can take take on. But uh, I mean, your point is good, and Yonhap has improved the the quantity and quality of its English uh, language news and also the speed. So you know they're they're, they're responding for, to the competitive pressures that f faced by the internet. Based news agencies in uh, in South Korea, the, especially the financial ones, that to money today and things. Like uh, that. I, I plagiarize all the time, but um, I, I give credit uh, uh, so that people know that it isn't old Chris reporting this. It's old Chris can read Yonhap or the Times or whatever it is. But but that uh, uh, being silly about it, but that, that's also an important point because it goes to one of the questions. Um, yeah, we we do need to share more, but actually we share a tremendous amount. Because you know, you see Paul in the you know in the hallway say, "Hey, Mitch, I just heard this. What did you hear? Oh, yeah, well, I just heard that." And I, you know, so 
no matter what the competitive pressures are, uh, we're all kind of combat soldiers out there getting shot at, you know, and and, uh, and we do help each other a tremendous amount. But I, And I think the longer you're in the business, the more friends you have. And despite competitive pressures, the more you do reach out. And, and if you get my report, you you see it, uh, 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 which also leads to the point about agenda setting and all that. And, you know, that is the editor's job. The editor's job is to decide decide what stories are important, to decide what what reporters to send out, to decide is the story that he or she filed a bunch of BS, you know, does it need to be redone, you know, all those things. So, you know, you could talk about bias, but is experience bias? Are shared values bias? You know, these it get, can get pretty subjective. So, uh, in a sense, the marketplace decides, are you really objective or not? Are you really doing a good job of covering things? And that's, you know, uh, the old joke, uh, you know, time will tell. If, if you don't do a good job of this stuff, people stop reading you. They don't resubscribe, you know, or they... they uh, uh, you know, they stop watching Fox News, you know? They just watch the football. Um, so, so there it is. Um, what was it? Better access, uh, you know, uh, we've all made the same speeches. If, if the people making the decisions don't have enough professionalism to understand why it's important to help you, there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Uh, but hope your editor will write something about it. Um, I think. Oh, I did. I for, I've been remiss in not mentioning. My daughter Margot is back in South Korea teaching English. This is her second tour, uh, uh, and that's part of the public diplomacy and all that. You know, here's an American girl who spent four years working for Congressman Jerry Connolly, uh, important uh, Korea uh, hand on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Margot did his federal casework. Uh, but really miss teaching. She'd been in Jeonju five or six years ago. She's back in Jeonju teaching uh, little guys again. Uh, so uh, at least one, you know, there is one bit of public diplomacy going on uh, with my family. So next time you're in Jeonju, give Margot a call. She'd be glad to see you. And you should go visit her to get out of Seoul again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I took the bus down. It was cool. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Van. <Beck. coughs> <coughs> 그, 문제를 말씀드렸습니다만, 사이즈를 떠나 미국이나 한국이나 언론인으로서의 공통 분모는 이 자리에서 확인한 자리 같습니다. 그 기자로서 느끼는 그 억세스 문제. 에, 아까 저첫 질문에서 리차드 스코스 씨께서 그 어, 지금 현재 어, 본인께서 그 사자회담 대변인 할때 말씀을 하셨는데 어, 저는 그렇게 생각합니다. 그 대변인의 입장이라고 하는 것은 대부분 완웨이가 될 가능성이 큽니다. 그러니까 기자들이나 언론에 대해서 자기가 알리고 싶은 것만 알리는 게 대변인이고 기자들이 알고 싶은 것은 선택적으로만 알려주는 거죠. 그러니까 저희들이 바라는 것은 어, 투웨이 쌍방향 쌍방향의 일종의 커뮤니케이션을 원하는 거라고 말씀드릴 수 있을 것 같고요. 그, 그리고 아까 저도 잘 몰랐는데 어째 오바마 정부에 들어가 가지고 백악관이 모든 국방과 그 외교 정책의 그 어, 컨트롤 권한을 가지고 극소수만 에, 그 권한을 행사하는지 어, 저도 궁금합니다. 어떻게 <웃음> 그런 일이 벌어지고 있는지 에, 알면 좀 알려주셨으면 좋겠습니다. 끝나고 나서라도 개인적으로 그 다음에 아까 그 억세스 문제하고 그 언론사 간의 그 경쟁 문제 그세 번째 질문에서 지적하셨는데. 저도 솔직히 그거, 그거 참 굉장히 능요한 문제입니다. 억세스 자체가 하나의 능력일 수가 있기 때문에 누가 많은 억세스를 할수 있느냐가 바로 그 기자의 능력이고 그 언론사의 힘이거든요. 그렇기 때문에 그거를 조화시킨다는 건참 쉽지는 않은 일인 것 같습니다. 현실적으로 어렵습니다. Did you wanna... no? All right. Well, uh, we are already uh, a few minutes over here, so um, I'm going to uh, bring this panel to a close. Please join me in thanking. Our, our four panelists, though. A uh, very stimulating discussion. A um, uh, few things. I invite you all to join us tomorrow morning uh, uh, for another session. Um, this is a two-day conference. Uh, from, from 10 to 11.30, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a roundtable on the interplay between civil society and government. Uh, it's going to make for some fascinating discussion again. Uh, so please join us. Uh, again, from 10 to 11.30 tomorrow. I believe, Roy, correct me if I'm wrong, we're on the fifth floor? Shihoko? Fifth floor? Oh, we're in the boardroom. I'm sorry. Boardroom right on the same floor, just uh, right over here. Um, uh, 
anyone who has used a headset, please remember to return it. They'll charge us $200 a piece Ooh. if we don't. So please return it. Um, and finally, uh, let me just thank um, uh, um, uh, my colleague in the Asia program who really organized this, um, along with, with the folks from, uh, from Miwa Women's University. So my colleague Shihoko Goto um, from the Asia program. Thank you. And, uh, um, and Roy Kim, who's my colleague in the History and Public Policy Program, who helped out as well. Um, uh, and thank you to the folks at IHWA, um, uh, to, to Dr. Cho and uh, to her colleagues, uh, who really did an amazing job um, uh, working with us to, to organize this first day. Um, thank you very much, and we'll see you all tomorrow morning. But are, are you going to be around this week? Or? Um, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but I'll be use, I'll, I'll be emerging more. Well, let's, you know, I took a little time off. Yeah, I was amazed by his coming.